You're a podcast listener, and this is a podcast ad. Reach great listeners like yourself with podcast advertising from Lips and Ads. Choose from hundreds of top podcasts offering host endorsements, or run a reproduced ad like this one across thousands of shows to reach your target audience with Lips and Ads. Go to lipsandads.com now. That's L I B S Y N ads.com. What's your biggest fear if the Harris Walls ticket is successful? Are you going to actively campaign for President Trump? Yes, I will. You were also talking about being blackballed by the media. As soon as I said something sensitive, they shut off the feed. This isn't opinion. This is empirical science, evidence-based. Why do you think they're so threatened? Do you think you can be the determining factor in this presidential election? Let me tell you about my day. I was scheduled to fly into Las Vegas to interview former president and current Republican nominee, Donald Trump, to have a sit down interview with him to talk about what's happening in this run up to the election, the last 76 days from Friday. Then we get word that RFK Jr. has a press conference and is going to make a really big announcement in Phoenix. So. I called RFK Jr. and said, I got a sneaking suspicion what's going to happen. I'd like to talk to you when you walk off of that stage. So I did the interview with former President Trump, jumped on the airplane, flew into Phoenix, and sat down and talked to RFK Jr. here. And as I'm sitting and talking to him, I'm very much aware that I may be talking to the one man that may be the single most outcome determinative individual on who is going to be the next president of the United States. So stay tuned and hear what RFK Jr. has to say that is so powerfully influential in the upcoming election. Robert, thank you for sitting down and talking to me. This has been a really pivotal day in your campaign and your life, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah it's a difficult day and in many respects, but, you know, I feel like I'm on the right path. You had, I think, close to, if not over a million people on your live stream for your press conference, and for anybody that is, is under a rock, you have suspended your campaign. You haven't dropped out of the campaign, you've suspended your campaign. How difficult was this decision? It was difficult. I mean, all of us, the people, you know, kind of the inner circle who were involved in the decision, I think everybody in that circle went back, did 180 degree turns maybe 15 times in the last two weeks trying to figure out what we can do. But ultimately, it was clear to me that because of the media censorship, because I was not going to be allowed on a, a debating stage, that I didn't really have it half the victory. So my choice was, am I going to spend the next 77 days you know, rallying the troops and, and getting more money out of the donors without being able to offer them a path to victory. And I think that would have sucked my soul out. And then, I, you know, I had this interesting series of meetings with President Trump in which he really surprised me by, by strongly endorsing the, the mission for his presidency, saying that he wanted his legacy to end the chronic disease epidemic in this country, and that's been my central mission for the past 20 years, is addressing that issue. What's happening to our kids? We have the sickest children in the world. You know, when I was a kid, about 6% of American children had chronic disease. Today, it's 60%. And these are in basically major categories like neurological illnesses, which is AS, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, tics, Tourette syndrome, narcolepsy, ASD, autism, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile diabetes, and then the allergic diseases like peanut allergies and food allergies and eczema. And all of these appeared in the mid 1980s. Oh, so, you know, I never saw anybody with any of these diseases when I was a kid. Well, I grew up in the 50s, and these weren't issues. They weren't issues. You didn't know anybody who had diabetes. You certainly did not know anybody who had autism. And now those... Or peanut allergies. Or peanut allergies. In fact, Congress asked the EPA, tell us what year these epidemics began. 
EPA scientists came back and said it's a red line 1985. That, that gives us a hint about the culprits because we know it's not a genetic, gen, that genetic injury. Genes don't cause epidemics. They may provide the vulnerability, but you need an environmental exposure, an environmental toxin. And so something happened in our kids around that, at that time, and it's probably a lot of different exposures the collapse of our food system, the industrialization of our food system, et cetera. You and I have talked before, and I've learned so much about you and so how deeply convicted you are about these things. And I tried to help millions of others that might not know how deeply convicted you are. I think we made a lot of progress in that regard. And I know that you're deciding to run and conducting this campaign came at a very high price to you personally, family-wise, professionally. And now as we sit here, I have to ask you, if you knew then what you know now, would you have done this? Yeah, I would have. I mean, I think it's been costly to me and it's been costly to my family. But I think I've advanced the issues in a way that is going to be helpful to people over the long run. Uh, the major issues that I've been talking about, the censorship, the addiction to war, particularly the Ukraine war, and then most of all the chronic disease epidemic. And I think, you know, it gave me a platform to talk about those issues and a lot more people are about aware of them now and a lot more people are, it's part of the national conversation, which it was not 16 months ago. Yeah, and I think people on the outside looking in don't realize what a sacrifice it is to make the decision you made. I mean, it's what, a 16-hour day is like a light day. <laughs> it's like, well, why get dressed if you're only going to do 16 hours, right? And it's day after day after day. And then you decide to do what you did today. Why now? Was there a reason you did it today instead of two weeks ago or two weeks down the road? It was just a confluence of, of events. I actually would have rather do it, done it a little later. You know, I finished writing my speech today at 11.10 and the press conference started at 11 and I was 30 minutes away. So I was 45 minutes late for the conference because, you know, I had only had it, uh, really 24 hours to write my statement. And so I would have preferred to do it under a more relaxed regimen, but, uh, well, you work well under pressure, though. I, I work well. We have a team that works well under pressure, and President Trump's staff had a whole series of other needs, and, you know, we basically, uh, uh, you know, we coalesced ar around their schedule. And I was with President Trump this morning, interviewed him in Las Vegas, and then I headed this way. He's not far behind me. And one of the things that I asked him was about you and what you were going to have to say today. And he had a comment about that for the record, and I wanted to share it with you and get your comments about that. RFK Jr. has offered his support to you and your campaign. How yes. do you feel about that? I'm very honored by it. He's a very uh, smart guy, a different kind of a guy, but very smart, loves our country, has uh, some I think very good views on a lot of different things. And I've known him for a long time. We've been somewhat friendly, actually. And I think he's going to be a great asset. I think he adds a lot to the election. He's got a good following, tremendous following. I think he adds a lot to the election. And I think he adds a lot to if we win. I mean, he's got some very interesting ideas and good ideas. I think he'll be a fantastic and influential person in terms of uh, getting this country back on track. I think uh, if we win, I think he can be very valuable to the country. And I think he can also help us build up the margins. Will he have a role in your administration? He's a very experienced trial lawyer. He is. Uh, he's, he's tried a lot of uh, large cases, so, and a lot of it environmental. So I thought, you know, he might play a role environmentally, he might play could a be. role as attorney general. There's a lot of things he could offer to the administration. That's true. That's true. No, he's a very smart guy. And but you welcome him. I do. You I've welcome his him. support. Well, number one, I've known him a long time. Right. And I've always had a good relationship. I mean, we're sort of on opposite sides of some issues. 
but I've always had a good relationship with him, and I'm very honored by his support. Well, I've, I've spoken to him about you in the past, and he's always spoken of you with a great deal of respect. Even though you guys have been campaigning against each other, yeah. he's always spoken of you with a great deal of respect. What's your reaction to his comments? You know, I think he's accurate. I, we've known each other for a long time. In fact, I've litigated against him. I've sued him a couple of times on golf courses that, uh, that he was building, or he's trying to build up in the New York State Reservoir watershed. And I was suing to keep them from being built. But even during that time when I was litigating against him, he ended up giving me a ride to Florida on his, on his plane. So, and we were friendly. And, you know, we had a great time and a lot of laughs. He's a very congenial, amiable, interesting guy, and very warm. Do you foresee pushing your agenda forward, maybe as part of that administration? Is that a possibility? Yeah, I mean, we talked about that. We talked about his commitment to chronic disease. It's one of the things that brought us together. The, the, a couple of hours after his, the assassination attempt, Phil, I got a call from Kelly Means, who's kind of the leading advocate in the country against chronic disease and for against processed food, which is really poisoning our children. He's been advising me for a long time on and consulting with me. And he called me that night and he said that he was also advising President Trump on this issue, which made me happy that President Trump even, you know, knew about this issue. And he asked if I'd be willing to talk to President Trump, and I said yes, and President Trump then called me a little while later. Um, and then we ended up meeting with each other the following day and then doing a series of meetings. And a lot of that time we spent uh, talking about the Ukraine war, about uh, dismantling this addiction that we have to foreign wars, but also talking about the, the chronic disease epidemic. And, you know, President Trump said that he wanted that as his legacy to, to solve it. So, uh, you know, I'll do anything that I can to make sure that happens. Having gotten to know you as I have, I have the feeling that you feel a sense of commitment to your supporters and to your donors and the things that they've supported and continued to, I can't imagine you telling them that that journey or fight is over. You're going to continue to push those issues. And part of the way to do that might be through the administration or it could be in other ways. But there's no way you're going to let up on the things that you've been espousing. I heard you in your press conference thanking them for their support and letting them know it's, that's not over you're continuing those same agendas, those same priorities. That's still important to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to use my own resources, my energies and talents, you know, as long as I can. This is, to me, the most important issue in our country today because we have the highest chronic disease burden of any country in the world, and it's destroying us. It's $4.3 trillion a year. It's costing our country to five times the military budget. When my uncle was president, the medical expenditures on chronic disease were zero. Today, it's 95% of our health care expenditures. It's, it's sinking our country. And we're getting sicker and sicker. We're, we're paying twice what Europeans do for, for health care. We have the worst health care outcomes in the world. It's all because we're being mass poisoned by processed foods, by pesticides, by chemicals, and by pharmaceutical drugs. And there's a series of industries that actually make money by keeping us sick. And it's not just industries, but it's the med schools, the hospitals, the insurance companies you would think would want us healthy, but they actually make more money if we get sicker. And then, of course, the pharmaceutical companies, if you have a chronic disease, you're a lifetime patient. This drug, Ozempic, costs $1,500 uh, for, <laughs> for a week. And there, there's now a bill before Congress that would force the insurance companies, Medicare, to pay for it for every American who's obese. Well, that's 74% of our population. Right. That's going to be $3 trillion a year. And for a tiny fraction of that, you could give every American three meals a day of organic food and diabetes would disappear overnight 
you know, diabetes is, is treatable with food, right. with exercise, and obesity is. Hey, it's Dr. Phil here. You know I bought my first gold coin over 25 years ago. I did it to protect my family and our financial future. Now back then, we were living in uncertain times and the national debt was growing larger every day. <laughs> and it is similar today. Higher taxes, government debt, and an unstable economy. It's more important than ever to buy gold and silver. Now like you, I cherish my faith, my family, and my financial freedom. That's why I recommend you get the Wealth Protection Kit from GoldCo, the top-rated precious metals company in the entire country. It shows you how to diversify and protect your retirement savings. Thankfully, with GoldCo, you get the peace of mind that thousands of their customers have protected their money with gold and silver. They are A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau and have earned over 6,000 five-star reviews. Now, right now, you could qualify for up to 10% instant match in bonus silver while supplies last. So call GoldCo at 855-969-GOLD to learn more. That's 855-969-GOLD. You're a podcast listener, and this is a podcast ad. Reach great listeners like yourself with podcast advertising from Lips and Ads. Choose from hundreds of top podcasts offering host endorsements, or run a reproduced ad like this one across thousands of shows to reach your target audience with Lips and Ads. Go to lipsandads.com now. That's L I B S Y N ads.com. And you know, what you talk about is empirically verified. This isn't just some theory that you hatch in your back room sometime. These things are factually based. They're empirical. And I think that's so important. It was important to me that whenever you were talking about this, you were also talking about being blackballed by the media because we had so many people that were not wanting to put you on the air, ABC, NBC, CBS, all the major networks, and this has continued. Now, at Marriage Street, we put you on, of course, and going to continue yeah. to put you on, as long as we can lure you in there. <laughs> because we're talking about science. This isn't opinion. This is empirical science, evidence-based. Why do you think they're so threatened? It, are we following the money here? Is that what it gets down to? I think the, in terms of uh, the television networks are very, very dependent on pharmaceutical advertising. I knew Roger Ailes very well. Roger Ailes was, of course, the founder of Fox News and the CEO of Fox News for many years. He and I were on opposite sides of the political spectrum, but we had this friendship that, that survived all that. He would always made sure that I could get on his platform to talk about environmental issues. So I was the only environmentalist who was going on Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly and Neil Cavuto for many, many years. And I, at one point, I made a film about the impacts of the relationship between mercury and this epidemic of neurological injuries and mercury in, in medical products. And I showed him the film and he, he said, you know, I have a family member who I think was um, injured by this. And he said, this is a really important film. He said, I can't allow you onto my network for this. Because for the evening news division, about 70% of our revenues are coming from pharmaceutical companies. And he said to me at that time that typically um, there are 23 ads on a, a evening news segment show, and that 17 of those on average are pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. He said, if any of my hosts allowed you on TV, I'd have to fire them. And if I didn't, I would hear from Rupert, meaning Rupert Murdoch, within 10 minutes. Yeah. He was very clear to me about that. I've seen that evidence across the board with all of the networks. They're very, very sensitive to their advertisers. And those companies are advertising not just as a platform for selling product, but also because they can dictate content. They can make sure that you know who's ever on that news show is, uh, is towing a line. Well, we had Kelly Means on my show Dr. Phil Primetime, talking about the very things that you're focusing on here. And my audience was fascinated yeah. because there were things they had not heard before. 
Yeah. There, there were facts, information they had not heard. In that show, we put it on our, we have an app, Merit Plus, where you can watch those shows after the fact. And that show just continued to, its audience grew and grew and grew, it continues to this day to grow based on the information that was given. Yeah. And people were fascinated yeah, by what he, he had to say. He's riveting. You're exactly right. And people don't know because the information is not being put out there. Did you ever think you would see this kind of censorship in our lifetime? No. I, it's shocking to me. Even today, I mean, I'm not shocked by it anymore. Yeah, no, we're not anymore. No, but I'm like, I'm even, you know, when I did my press conference right now, as soon as I said something sensitive, CNN shut off the, the feed and Facebook did, did too. So, you know, I won a case. In fact, this week I got a, a judgment from a, a federal court against the Biden White House for censoring um, my speech on the social media platforms, for ordering the social media platforms to censor my speech. 37 hours after he took the oath of office, President Biden's White House was opening these portals and this is all in the judge's decision. It's a 155-page decision. The portals were run by the FBI, but all these other agencies like the CIA, CISA, which is the, the center of the, uh, of the censorship industrial complex, um, the IRS, DHS, were invited into this portal, which gave them access to all the social media sites, and they were allowed to censor those and people that they didn't like. And you know, it's uh, they called it misinformation, but actually, Facebook at one time we we know this from because we have the emails. And actually, what he's saying is scientifically accurate. And so they came up with a new word called malinformation, which is information that is factually accurate, but it is nevertheless inconvenient for the government. And that was one of the categories that so they. So that's were, malinformation. You know, George Martin said. The government does not tear a man's tongue out um, to stop him from telling lies. They tear his tongue out to stop him from telling the truth. Yeah. Uh, at the White House urging, Instagram deplatformed me, and I lost a million followers. And, but Instagram was not able to point to a single post of mine that was factually inaccurate. We had, by that time, the most robust fact-checking operation probably in the country. We had a, a volunteer group of 350 MD science, MD physicians and PhD scientists, including Luc Montagnier, who, who won the Nobel Prize for, studying the, for discovering the AIDS virus. We had this group that was a scientific advisory group that was looking at everything that we posted and everything we posted was cited and sourced to either peer-reviewed publication or a, or a government database. We were very careful about every, to make sure everything was documented truth. And nobody else really does that these days, but, um, but we were doing it. But nevertheless, they deplatformed me and said it's from misinformation, but they couldn't point to a single post I'd made that was actually factually inaccurate. It was disturbing for our democracy because you know, Hamilton, Madison, and Adams said that we put uh, freedom of expression in the First Amendment because all the other rights are dependent on it. If, if you have a government that can silence its critic, that government has license for every atrocity. Yeah. And, you know, there's never been a time, a time in history where we look back and say, the guys who were censoring speech were the good guys. They're always the bad guys because it's always the first step down that slippery slope to totalitarianism. They start with censoring speech and once they can do that, they can really do anything. And in a democracy, democracies are, are constructed on this infrastructure of the free flow of information that we can all get access to information. And there, the theory is that through the fierce um, annealment in the furnace of debate, that the best ideas rise and that's, you know, democracy can that then take, take advantage or make policy of ideas that have triumphed in a marketplace. This is the, our advantage over totalitarian systems because totalitarian systems are much more efficient. If you can just tell everybody what to do and make sure. decisions instantly and there's no, you know, there's no pushback and their democracies are sloppy, but, but they, they can outbeat, outcompete totalitarian systems because 
that mechanism of free flow of information and debate gives us an advantage in the marketplace and in government. Information flows are the, are the sunlight, they're the soil, they're the fertilizer, and the water for democracy. And when you cut it off, democracy withers and dies. You're a podcast listener, and this is a podcast ad. Reach great listeners like yourself with podcast advertising from Lips and Ads. Choose from hundreds of top podcasts offering host endorsements, or run a reproduced ad like this one across thousands of shows to reach your target audience with Lips and Ads. Go to lipsandads.com now. That's L I B S Y N ads.com. In your press conference, you, you, you talked about the Democrat Party as though you feel like it doesn't exist the way it existed a generation ago yeah. or two generations ago, that there's not a Democrat Party as you knew it growing up. Is that an yeah, accurate I mean, read? It, Did I hear you right? Yeah, it still has this kind of tribal identification. Um, but the things that it stood for, like, you know, the Kennedy Democrats, my father, my uncle's Democratic Party was very different. That Democratic Party was anti-war, it was, you know, pro-constitutional rights, pro-civil rights, starting with the Bill of Rights and the freedom of speech. It was on the side of working people and cops and firefighters. It was on the side of the environment, but not just climate change and big, you know, offshore windmills and carbon capture. It was protecting habitat and whales, which it's doing the opposite today. And then it was on the side of, of Main Street, you know, small business, and it was the opponent of the corporate capture and this, this merger of state and corporate power of big money, big data, big tech, big banking, Wall Street. But today, that is the constituency of the Democratic Party. It's the big powerhouses there. The cops and firefighters are long gone, and any kind of loyalty to, to labor is pro forma. They're How not, was it hijacked? Who hijacked it? I think, you know, the big change that happened came with the Citizen United case. So we had a law in this country that was passed in 1908 um, that made it illegal for corporations to give to federal political candidates. And we had, prior to that, we had really lost our democracy. And there was a series of laws that happened, you know, that Teddy Roosevelt and, and the muckraking journalists and the populists and the progressives at the beginning of the century really restored democracy from the Gilded Age when, you know, the Rockefellers and the Morgans and the Carnegies and the Fricks took control of our government. So they made direct election of senators. They gave women the vote. They made the 40-hour work week. They banned child labor. They implemented the first income tax so that wealthy people had to pay their share and, and corporate income taxes as well. The most important thing that they did was they passed a law that made it illegal for corporations to donate to federal political candidates. Well, in 2010, 102 years later, a very business-friendly Supreme Court said, made a holding that donations are a form of free speech. They're therefore protected by the First Amendment. And this unleashed a tsunami of, of, uh, of corporate wealth into the American political process, and it put all of these terrible trends on steroids. The total cost of the presidential campaign was about a billion dollars. This year, this presidential candidate uh, campaign will cost 15 billion. And to run for Senate in New York, it costs $300 million. So that the guy who's running today is spending his entire time calling up millionaires and billionaires, because that's the only thing he has time to do. So if you can't write that check, he's not going to be talking to you. And he just doesn't have time to do it, because he needs to be dialing for dollars all the time. And, and you started to see after that, all of these mechanisms put in place that have shifted wealth upward from the middle class, American middle class to the to this new oligarchy of billionaires. And during COVID, you know, it was kind of the coup de grace of that trend. So COVID, we shut down all the Main Street businesses, 3.3 million businesses, insane. Yeah. And they didn't come back. No, and 41% of black owned businesses will never reopen. They're, and some of those are three generations of equity in them. Yeah. And who did we leave open? Amazon and, you know, and Walmart and Facebook. And they all made billions and billions because they got to close their competitors. 
And there was $4.3 trillion shifted upward from the American middle class to this you know, new aristocracy that we have. And we created in 500 days a billionaire a day globally. So you're seeing this concentration of wealth and, you know, between the Citizens United case in 2010 and COVID in 2020, 10 years, I think our, gov our government, the political parties, everything in our country was transformed. And you're seeing more and more infiltration by the, and, and evidence of the intelligence agencies manipulating the public, controlling the media, you know, these really disturbing, terrible trends that are going to now again accelerate with the introduction of AI. What's your biggest fear if the Harris Walls ticket is successful? I think we're going to get more debt. Um, we're going to get, we're already at $35 trillion debt. The Biden administration is, is running up a, a trillion dollars every 90 days. You know, we're already spending more on our servicing that debt than on our, our um, and not on the military. Within five years, 50 cents out of every dollar we collect in taxes is going to go to servicing the debt. Within 10 years, 100%. Yeah. So, so you never get anywhere. Right. And, and it's insane. And nobody is talking about it. Nobody's doing anything about it. I think we're going to see more wars. Vice President Harris, his speech was this, you know, extremely belligerent, you know, muscular pronouncement of, about American empire. It's all the stuff of, you know, the last century that we should be getting away from. We should have a multipolar world where America can really shine, but we're destroying ourselves. We're destroying our moral authority. We're destroying our economy. I think we're going to get more censorship, and I don't think that Vice President Harris has any consciousness or any, you know, worry about how AI is going to affect humanity. And, you know, AI, Dr. Phil, could be a really good thing for us. It can, you know, solve all these medical problems, solve poverty, everything else. And it can actually make government more transparent, more responsive to the people. But it also and is more likely that it will be used by government to absolutely enslave us because, you know, they, it gives these, these secretive agencies the ability to warp our realities, to control our behavior, to control our perceptions, and, you know, to monitor and to surveil us. And so we need to be building the bulwarks of our Bill of Rights up higher, and we need to all be conscious of what might happen. And we need a president in there who actually is going to be you know, meeting with all of the, the right people, meeting with Iran, with China, with Putin, and saying, okay, let's do a, an agreement on how we regulate this. We can't overregulate it. You can't overregulate it in this country because then you drive it abroad. Yeah. Oh, we need to we need to make the United States the hub for it. Uh, we also need to make sure that it's, it grows responsibly rather than, you know, grows into a, something that's going to kill. I mean, Elon Musk said, first it's going to steal our jobs and it's going to kill us. And, you know, that is a very highly, highly likely outcome. That was him being serious. Do you have concerns about the integrity of this election coming up? I do. Democrats today are very angry at anybody who questions the election integrity. He shouldn't be. In 2001, every Democrat believed the election was stolen from Al Gore, you know, by the Bush administration. In 2004, I wrote an award-winning article for Rolling Stones talking about the theft of the 2004 election. And nobody called me unpatriotic. You know, it's just, it's a fact. We, we need to be responsible civically. And everybody knows any machine can be hacked. What safeguards do we have in place to make sure that's, and that's what we should be talking about. Instead of getting angry at people for saying, you know, elections can be hacked, let's talk about how we fix the system. We put a man on the moon, we have ATM machines on every block that never get hacked. We have, you know, the, you came from Las Vegas this morning, that entire city is built on machines that can count right and never right. make mistakes and never give you too much money back. And so we can do it. And you need paper ballots. You need something to check the election. And, and that's what we should be talking about rather than did this one get hacked or did that one. Well, they've used lawfare to keep you off the ballots. Yeah, you know, exactly. That's another challenge. You know, it's not just technology. It, sometimes it's just flat out assault and using the court system. It's already affected this election. 
by keeping you off the debate stage and off ballots. Uh, so it's already been affected, in my view. Yeah, I believe that I would have won the election if it was the, the old kind of elections that we used to have, with you know a primary where there were people could run if they wanted, where they had uh, fair counts, where they had open debates. What happened with me is we had to do something that was considered insurmountable, which is to get a million signatures, and we did it. We had 100,000 volunteers in 50 states. They were working 10-hour days. They were working in blizzards and blazing heat. And every time that they would show up at the Board of Elections with these giant piles of, of boxes filled with, you know, thousands of signatures, the next day we would get sued. And we would be in front of a Democratic judge, and the, the lower court judges would hold against us, and then we'd have to appeal it and appeal it, and we'd go up and we get it reversed. We won every case, ultimately. But that should not be part of the system. That's not really democracy. I mean, you crafted a, a, a trail in, in your press conference. You're staying on the ballot in the red and blue states. In the swing states, people have said that this could come down to 15 counties in 11 different states, 11 of those counties in seven states, including where we are right now, that you said you don't want to be on the ballots there. You don't want people to vote for you there. Do you think you can be the determining factor in this presidential election? because of the positioning. Of course, if they don't get to 270, if they tie at 269, whole different ball game. If this comes down to independence in those 15 counties in those 11 states, and you've given your support to the Trump candidacy, do you feel like you may very well be the one that selects the next president of the United States by your influence? That's possible, but I, I, could, I would have, if I had stayed on the ballot in the swing states, and what I've done, Phil, is I we're taking my name off the ballots in 10 states that are swing states. We're leaving them on, my, my name on in the red states and the blue states so people can vote for me without consequence. You know, they're, they're not going to be scared, oh, the bad guy's going to get elected. You know who's going to get elected in those states. So, and so it allows people to vote for me who want to vote for me without any consequence. But, well, we recognize from our polling is that if I stayed in the race, it would have almost certainly swung the race to Vice President Harris, who was trying to throw me off the ballot in all the states. Ironically, I thought that that would not be a good outcome because I differ with her on all the issues, war and the censorship of chronic disease and uh, many, many other issues. I didn't think it would be right to give the election to her. And our polling from the beginning showed pretty consistently that if I got out of the race, 57% of the people who were supporting me would vote for Trump. And so me staying in the race would have swung the race, very likely could have swung the race to Harris. And so just getting out of the race, I think, makes it a fair race between them. And then well, I you're think- you're close to double digits in some of these swing states. Yeah, I am. And the 57% of those people go to former President Trump, that's a real boost to him. That's a real boost yeah, to him. Yeah, it is. Our decision, or my decision about what to do, I think is, uh, it's much more likely that President Trump will get elected. So you do acknowledge that? Yes. And you have enough that you agree with him on priority-wise that you're more comfortable with that than if it went the other way? Even yes. though you've grown up, even though I grew a up in the Democratic Party, and you know my, I had the same kind of orientation towards um, abhorrence for, I'd say, President Trump as many Democrats maybe you know four years ago, um, mainly because of his environmental stances, which I continue to disagree with. But our conversation, my conversation with President Trump very amiable and I he, you know he talked about starting a unity party about President Lincoln and his team of rivals and I could come in and support him because of these existential issues censorship war chronic disease that I feel strongly about he feels strongly about and that Kamala is on the wrong side 
I thought I could continue to criticize him on issues where I don't agree with him. And he was very comfortable with that. And I, I like that too. I don't, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to co-sign a lot of the no, of things course. he says and, and endorses, but I, on those issues and on the border, I'm, I'm with him. Are you going to actively campaign for President Trump? Yes, I will. So I may be sitting here talking to the one person in this country that is going to pick the next president of the United States by that what you did That is possible. That is, that is possible. It certainly is. I learn something every time I talk to you, and I hope we can continue this in the next 77 days and beyond because you have things that this country needs to hear about. Thank you very much. Robert, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Phil. Well, there you have it, my sit-down interview with RFK Jr. He's still on the ballot in the red and blue states, but he is off the ballot in the 10 swing states that are controlled really by the independents that could be the ones that determine who the next president of the United States is going to be. It's going to be a very interesting run-up to this election. You heard what he had to say. I asked the questions that I think you would have asked. I want you to know I've also made requests to Kamala Harris and her vice presidential pick, Walls, to talk to them, to sit down and ask them the questions that I'm asking the Republican candidates. I'm apolitical. I don't ever say how I'm going to vote. And listen, I've voted both ways over the years. But I want to talk to both sides because I want to ask them the questions I think you want to ask. Not just hearing stump speeches, not just having them read off prompters and give their pivot points. So know that I've got a request out to talk to those folks as well and hopefully I'll be bringing them to you very soon. I'm after them and I want to talk to them.